All right. So we are going to get started. I love this. Gary, I keep calling him Gary, but it is Dr. Gary Black at APU. I first met him. He works with Scott at APU, and they're over there, but they also definitely have a pastor's heart, both of them. And so I'm sure I'm not giving him the proper introduction as he should be. It's full. We're going to start. But I'm just going to let you take it over. This is my friend Gary and Dallas's friend. Um, introduce your family. Tell us some things, and we'll get started. Well, it's uh, it's great to be here. When, when Debbie called and said, you know, would this be something you'd be interested in doing, I said, absolutely. But I, I also admitted to her that when I heard it was a, a women's only ministry, there's this thing that kind of occurs in the stomach. And, um, and I said, you know, I, I feel like that I'm, I'm auditioning for a role in Steel Magnolias, the movie. <laughs> and why, why, why would you want a man in that movie with all of those wonderful characters, you know, that carry the movie? Um, we had the same question. Yeah, I, well... <laughs> Because the truth of the matter is, I mean, this, this is honest, and I'm not just playing to the crowd. This is the, this is the truth. The majority of the character of Christ uh, that I learned in my life was from women. The compassion, the love, the devotion, the faithfulness. I learned that from women in my life. Women in the church. I learned to pray from women. Um, I learned some wonderful things from men, Dallas being one of them, but I learned... Other things just as deeply from his wife, Jane. And so in some ways, I'm like, why would you want me to come maybe mess this up? No. For, you know, the, but I'll do my best, and I'm, I'm honored to be here. And this is a great subject, a very deep and meaningful and important subject. And I'm really encouraged at your courage to take on the subject, because this is as deep as it goes. So if, if you felt like that you somehow kind of, you know, like we sometimes do when we're kids, we're, we're in the shallow end, and then we're walking, and then it just, the water starts getting deeper, and then all of a sudden you can't feel the bottom anymore. If, that, if this book felt a little bit like that for you, you're, you're, in, in, good, uh, you're in good company, because the the soul is a is not an easy thing to get your your hands around but it's an incredibly important concept of the nature of human existence that we have too long and and at our peril forsaken to pay attention to so i really applaud you for taking on this subject because and, and John, too, for taking on this subject. John really took chapters 3 and 4 and, I think, 11 of Renovation of the Heart, which Dallas wrote. And those are the, the chapters uh, that deal with the soul, the life of the soul, the ruined soul, and then the restoration of the soul. So if you want, you know, after this, I think you've got some time before the next book you pick up, right? So if you want to do some reading over the holidays between now and the next, the, the next book study that you do, uh, pick up Renovation of the Heart, and you'll have, uh, 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 I think, an even more descriptive understanding of what John now is trying to illustrate. Now, here's what you need to know about John and Dallas. Dallas never gives any stories right? It's, it's, uh, it's like my daughters say to me, Dad, your books are so boring because there's no pictures in them. <laughs> That's true. Um, John puts pictures in his books. Dallas never was really illustrative and didn't use metaphors and illustrations. He would in his preaching and teaching at times, but not very much. And there was a special reason why he didn't do that. But John, being a full-time pastor, recognized that illustrations, metaphors, stories, narratives, really give handles to ideas. And so John has been very, very important to uh, the 
carrying on the legacy and the, and the ideology that Dallas brought, the deep thinking that Dallas brought to the church. I mean, a, a lot of people, I, tremendous numbers of people I meet say, you know, I really love the divine conspiracy. And I'll look at them and they'll go, okay, yeah, I didn't read it. I didn't get all the way through it. But I, you know, I'm working on it. I've had it only 11 years. It's on my bedside table. And it's, you know, the divine conspiracy is like a cheesecake. You can't eat it at one setting. You've got to nibble at it over time. Maybe it's like a fruitcake, you know, just kind of sticks around. But you've got to nibble at it over time. And you've got to, you've got to marinate it. And, and you've got to stop and then let that reality begin to work its way through your life. And these books are not easy books, right? And part of the reason is, is that we're not really trained to think the way we used to be able to think, right? We're not, um, you know, I don't think this is, the, the, this is the case in the Nazarenes as much, but a, across American evangelicalism, you know, Sunday school's going away. So a lot of these concepts that are communicated to us, uh, used to be communicated to us early. We don't really have the ability to chew on these things for decades while we're growing in Christ and we're being discipled so that when we become adults, we actually can do what Paul says and we can walk away from the milk and begin to eat the meat. That's really not the way that so many of us now that have come to Christ as adults, we, we don't have this knowledge that was once very readily available. So I applaud you for jumping into this stuff because it really does make a huge difference and John has done an amazing job at trying to bring some of these kind of ideas that are way up here right down at the shelf levels so that you can actually do something with them okay and I think it's important because without John I never would have discovered Dallas Willard because it was someone my husband read and yep. knew about and so John helped me when I was reading the book over the summer I was like oh my land who's Dallas Willard and then my love of this man i watched i think i've seen almost every lecture he has on youtube um and so yeah Jones. dallas yeah. not john's yeah. he has way too many yeah. um but dallas yeah. and so i think that what i love about that and what i'm hoping you can help us we still have questions because it does have to get down to the level as i always say how's your homework if it's not working at home it's not working so if we're just going to church on Sunday and Wednesday and we're not being transformed, it's not working. Right. And I will say in our denomination, it's the exact opposite. We're actually bringing back training for elementary age kids in their theology so they don't have that faith of crisis at 18. And then what I've loved in this class is hearing people say, I've been in the church over 50 years and finally I get my soul. Mm. And that's so fun. So yeah. can you help yeah. those of us just get started so on let our me, soul? Let me, so I'm a teacher. So the teacher's job is to uh, help you learn. So it's not to just talk, right? It's to help you learn. If I've helped you learn, then I've succeeded as a teacher. I'm not Correct. here to prove to you how smart I am or think I am. So I need your help to help me help you learn. Because I, I think I know some things that will benefit you in your learning. But this is why the Q&A is so important, is to help me understand what it is that you need to know that I can help you to understand. Does that make sense? So we've got to have a little bit of a dialogue. So we've got to break down this speaker-listener thing a little bit. Can we just do We're that? We're really we good just, at that. May, okay, good. Yeah. All right. We're very good. Right. So let me... On page, I think it, uh, in your books, is it 42? Is there an illustration in 42, which is the circles of the self? Okay. Now, John um, misses. I don't, I don't know. I haven't talked to him about whether he intended to miss it or if it's just a, a little error in the book. But there's a, there's a circle missing in that in that um, illustration. So what we have in the middle is we have the heart, okay, which is also, you could call it the will or the spirit. So in Scripture, those three words are synonymous. Spirit, will, and heart. Dallas used to call this, this is your wanter. It's what you want. What you really want in your life starts really at the heart. Okay, and that's your will. Your will drives you. When you put, I will do that. It comes from the most inner central part of your existence, your will. That's also your spirit. The nature of who you are 
is spiritual. You're an eternal, non-ceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. That's who you are. You're a spiritual person having a physical experience. We, we often get that backwards. We think we're physical people having a spiritual experience. Actually, the nature of who you are, God breathed a ruach, a spirit, into you. So the nature of who you are is will, heart, or spirit. The next is mind. Okay? Your mind. This is your thoughts and your feelings. Your thoughts and your your emotions. You could call it your emotions. Now, you do feel in your body, but the sense of fear, if I came at you, the sense of fear actually hits your mind, your central nervous system, and then it goes to your body. Right? So your mind, this your mind is also encapsulated by ideas, ideas, thoughts, ideas, and images. Primarily, evil works at the level of ideas and images. Okay? As does the gospel. Ideas and images. Okay? Then we have your body. We all know what that is. A mortal coil. Right? But this is also what Dallas used to say would be your power pack. It is the, the space that you inhabit. It is your first kingdom. One of the things I can, I'll never forget is watching my daughters find their hand. I'm doing that, right? That's an amazing, so my will is actually causing my body to move. You can't do anything, including writing a check, which is an expression of your will without your mind, your heart, and your body working in tandem. Integrated right? So this is your body. The next thing that John doesn't have on his is your relationships. So once I have my heart and my mind and my body, now I go body to body. This is relationships. This is a huge part of the nature of who we are. We live in relationship to one another. And then all of that My heart, my will, my spirit, my mind, my ideas, my feelings, my emotions, the images and and thoughts that I have running through my mind, the way in which my body acts or reacts, what my body desires. It's huge, right? The desires that are in my flesh. Then my relationships, the way in which we interact with one another. There is a tremendous amount of feedback that you are giving me right now that I am processing through my eyes into my mind, and it's causing something to occur at my heart level, right? That's all happening, like, in nanosecond speed, right? Nanosecond speed. All of that is my soul. All of that combined. So here's a great illustration, I think, to think about. And John does a pretty good job of this, but but maybe I can help. This is kind of what I try to do in some of my classes, and Leslie is a student. She's absolutely bored because we spent, I don't know, what, 13 weeks on this one image? (laughs) Just breaking this down, right? So you're getting 13 weeks. You're getting a $3,000 seminary class here in in an hour. So leave the checks in the back, in the basket, right? So the soul is your life. It's it's your life. It's your whole life. It's not just the spark of your life, okay? It's your whole existence. So sometimes we can get, sometimes words... English is actually a pretty clumsy language. Greek is a much better, much clearer language. And in Greek, there's a word for this, your total existence, and it's zoe. Your zoe. And that is completely different than other forms of life. Just exist, just, you know, a plant is alive. That's not zoe. No, zoe is... 
All of it. It's the whole enchilada, all at once. It's your soul. So let me give you an example. One of the things I think might be confusing, and I, I read the book, I, I, I kind of scanned it when it came out. That's what we do. We, you know, academics, we read the first. You critique each other's books, don't you? Yeah, notice. we read the first chapter. I mean, we read the, yeah, the first chapter and the last chapter. We read the first paragraph of every chapter. We read the first sentence and the last sentence of every other paragraph afterwards, and then we read the last paragraph of every chapter, and then we say we read the book. But, but you can get we the, don't do that. Huh? We don't do that. No, and you shouldn't. But that's the way you can really get a pretty good sense of what the author's doing if, the, if, you, if you do that system. You can read a lot of books that way and get the, the arguments that are made. You don't have to look at, the, you don't want the stories and analogies. And, you just want the arguments. You want the points to, that, that, that the person's making. That's the way, because we, we kind of live in the, in the realm of ideas. Um, and John does a very good job of kind of encapsulating this, but I think sometimes our language catches us, catches us kind of unawares because, uh, you know, if I use the word life or if I use the word soul, if I, if, if e even there's a couple of times in the book where he uses the word your soul thinks, right? And I get what he's trying to do, but that, that I think sometimes that would confuse, tend to confuse people because that's a mind issue. Your soul doesn't think, you think, and your soul's affected by your thinking. So let me give you an analogy I think that works, okay? You tell me if it works. So, any of you baseball fans? Okay. So, you don't... Yeah, giants. <laughs> you don't practice baseball. You don't practice baseball. You don't eat, well, you do play baseball, but you, you can't go out and say, I'm going to work on my baseball game. Do you? No. The first thing you do is you work on pitching. And the second thing you do is you work on hitting. And the third thing you do is you work on fielding. And then maybe you're going to work on teamwork. And if you put all those aspects of the game together, you're playing baseball. So what John is saying is, you don't work on your soul. You work on the things that are in your soul that affect your whole life. Because one of the things that you're going to recognize is, there's going to be very, very few times in your life where you actually get to meet your soul. There's very, very few times in your life. Which, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. So you don't work on your soul. You work on the things that make up your soul. Like, I don't work on baseball. I work on my teamwork. I work on my fielding. I work on my hitting. And I work on my pitching. That's so good. Right? That totally helps us. So, the spiritual disciplines. So, what are the things that are affecting my heart? So, let me just do this because I really like to do this. I hope you like it. So, the gospel comes in. The gospel of Jesus comes in to your life. And it hits your mind first. Did you know that? Now, there, there, I've heard a few people, very rare, where it doesn't come in as a set of ideas, that they actually meet Jesus and they don't really know who he is. That's cool. But most of us meet, come to an understanding of the gospel as a set of ideas. The resurrection is an idea. It's a fact, too. But it's... it's when, it, when you're first hearing it, it comes in as an idea. There was a God-man that lived a sinless life, that died for my sins on the cross, and when I put my confidence in the way in which he lived and how he demonstrated righteousness in the kingdom of God to me, if I put my confidence and live in that way and accept his grace and forgiveness for my sin, I have the ability to live a life that is full and to the abundant 
kind of overflowing existence that starts now and goes, in, goes for the rest of my life. You know what that is? That's a big idea. And that idea has got in some way, shape, or form to captivate you. But you know as, as incredible numbers of, numbers of people that that idea never gets out of their head. They just don't, they, they can't put their mind around those ideas. They can't see it. They can't believe it. It doesn't make sense to them. That's all cognitive thinking kinds of, they doubt whether or not it's actually true. They've got all kinds of arguments about why it's not. It never gets out of the head. It gets stuck in the mind. This is part of the reason why so many uh, people are devoted to things called apologetics. It's making an argument. And that is at the level of the head. Once the mind can grasp it, and you start most of the time, for most people, they begin to go, you know what? That story is a better story than I'm living. And the pain of change starts to look a lot less than the pain of staying the same. Right? And when that begins to happen, the Holy Spirit's working, continuing to woo, continuing to argue, continuing to demonstrate, continuing to make a plea, a plea to woo, to entice, to demonstrate, then it can get into the heart. Now we're to the want center. I actually want that life. I actually pick up my cross. I actually obey and believe that God's way for me is best. Now, am I green? You bet. Am I going to fail? Am I going to struggle? Do I have to learn? Do I have to? Absolutely, I do. But once the heart has actually grasped, I want that. That's what I want. Then the gospel can begin to work its way out to the other aspects of the life. It can begin to work on all those ideas. We call them oftentimes lies. Myths, mistruths, half-truths, fictions about who and what you are and why you're here. And then your body, why you're here. Actually, you don't have to listen to your body. Addiction primarily is the mind allowing the body to tell it what to do, which then affects the heart. That's what addiction is. It's an addiction to feeling through the body. And that it comes from an idea that that's the only way I can thrive is through my body. And Paul talks about this over and over. The lust of the flesh, the wickedness of of the flesh. There is a mind of the flesh. There's that language. Right? And then, it, so it works its way through from our heart, through our mind, into our body, and then through into our relationships. And now, all of a sudden, once all of these areas continue to be progressively submitted to the way of Christ, I am the truth I am the way, and I am the zoe. I'm the life. Right? Which, in Hebrew now, those are all synonyms for one word. Torah. The teaching of God. The way of God. The rules of God. The life of God. Torah. Jesus is saying to all of those first century Jews, I'm the Torah. I'm Psalm 119. That's who I am. I am the instruction for life and living. I'm demonstrating it to you. I'm embodying it. And you, when you follow after me, are salt and light and together a city on a hill. Just like if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. When you are living a life that comes from the inside out, 
where your entire zoe is redeemed. Your soul is saved, rescued. Rescued, that's what that is. Delivered. Delivered from, which is the exact same word that the Old Testament uses for the Israelites that were delivered from slavery. Delivered into a life that has... Now, get, get, okay, then I'm going to shut up and ask, get, do a question. I'm going to start preaching in a minute. So, we, we need to get this, 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 this thing we've so missed. And I, I, I know because Scott preaches this so often that you're going to just go, duh. But I'm going to say it anyway. We've so missed the idea that the eternal life is life after death. It's life that has no end in quantity or quality. It's unending. It's that overflowing life, that effervescent bubbling over that can't be held back. It's that life that never ends in quality and quantity. That is the soul. So what John is trying to do, and I think does expertly is trying to get those of us who have not recognized what our life is, these components of our life, to begin to focus on those areas that are actually bruising or neglecting or alienating our soul. Does that make sense? But I don't directly go out, Dallas would make this point time and time again, you do not go out specifically to save or fix your soul. What you do is you try to hit the curveball. Or you try to run, you work on your running or your teamwork. Well, I'm going to give you the curveball then. Because here, the first seven okay. ones of these are exactly what I think transformed me the most this summer was learning to take hurry out of my life. And then many of the questions are, but can you describe to us the difference between busy and hurried? And in one of the videos, John says he's very distraught with his church growth. Did you think the people weren't being transformed by his messages. And so he met with Dallas and he said, John, you must relentlessly take hurry out of your life. And he said, okay, but what else? <laughs> and he said it again. So explain that to us. And then what does that look like? How do we do that? So hurry... You can see, now I'm going to just leave that up there because you're going to see that hurry is a kind of cross life event. Because hurry comes from a desire. I actually want to be busier than I need to be. And that comes from an idea that you need to be busier. In some way, shape, or form, that it could be that. Because hurried and busy are not the same thing. Because he does... He, well... You disagree? I, I think that... I don't know that it's... In our culture, it's, it's as helpful to be discerning between the difference between busy and hurried because I think we could figure a way to convince ourselves that are really hurried, that we're just busy. Mm -hmm. And go, oh, no, 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 I'm not hurried, I'm just busy. Meanwhile, the soul sinks. I think that we're, we're never too busy, nor would, should be, we be hurried about what God has planned for us. I don't think busy or hurry is a part of the God-ordained life. I'm never too busy to get done what God has planned for me. He never loads my wagon more than I can pull. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he doesn't seem to have a time, timer on me. He's got, a, he's got eternity. And he's got unlimited power. Now, I've got a lot of responsibility. And maybe that's what you mean by busy. And if I've got a lot of responsibility and there's a lot of things to get done, and I can see a lot of opportunity in my life, great. And there are times when the needs of people begin to weigh on us. That's typically where we get most busy, is that people's needs that we love begin to weigh on us. And I would just humbly suggest to you that at some point in time that begins to develop a little bit of crisis of faith that God actually can take care of them. 
and that somehow your responsibility is to worry for them that God does take care of them. I mean, I, you know, my grandmother was an amazing woman, but I really think she felt it was her spiritual responsibility to worry for the world. And that kind of drove her to pray, but the prayer never actually helped the worry go away. It's almost like she was nagging God to get on with it. I mean, can you really, you know what I mean? She wasn't taking this moment captive, living in right. the moment. Okay. And that's a, see, the, no, so hurry then becomes, it affects, stress is killing us. That's a body issue. It affects our relationships, right? Person to person. I don't have time. I mean, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm terrible at all of this. My wife, she's just sitting right over there, she, uh, there's times when I come home and I'm busy and I'm in a hurry and I've got things going on and she'll see what I do. I'll come and I go, how you doing? Well, I mean, uh, how's the kids? The kids good? Did, did the guy come with the lawnmower and did he fix the thing and the this, the that and the other thing? And then did we get the bill paid on that other deal? And did the guy come to fix the cable on the TV? And how are we doing? And, da, da, da. and she goes, stop checking your list off with me. And let's have a conversation. And that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going down. I'm trying to be responsible, but I'm in a hurry. Mm-hmm. Like, I want to, I know I have responsibilities and I, I care, but I'm, 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 there's a the list in my head. So I don't want you to think that I'm perfect at this stuff. I'm not in any way, shape, or form. But I, but I get it. Right? And, and I so think I'm striving for it. you have that moment where you are aware that, wow, I'm back to living my old hurried self, then that, that's the first step for most of us. It is. And that's where the discipline disciplines comes in. So if my relationships are affected, like my, my, my family begins to get affected by my kind of disregarding them, that's a relationship issue. My mind says that I've got, two, I've got all these responsibilities and maybe I need to look good to my colleagues or my boss or whoever that that's driving me right and i really want recognition see see so see how it's there's a desire thing that begins to it goes with my the thoughts about who i am and who i need to be and 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 whether or not god is a part of that or not and then it begins to work in my body and i get stressed and i overeat and i don't sleep and that begins to work itself out right and i get stressed and i have to you know all of a sudden i'm going to the chiropractor and i'm getting trying all this stuff and and then, of course, you know, we, we have people that are going to start drinking and self-medicating or they're going to overeat and they're going to whatever. There's a lot of ways that our body begins to tell us, hey, we can't keep this us. And we say, oh, yeah, 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 you can actually. And my relationships begin to get affected. And now I've got a soul fracture. That's a soul. Hurry is a soul level issue. So what Dallas is trying to tell John as a pastor who's trying to model Life in the kingdom of God that has a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. He's telling John, you got to eat your cooking in front of your people. You got to eat your cooking. That's why relentlessly eliminating hurry really begins to go to all areas of the life. And that's why it's so cru- crucial. Right. And I think it's hard for us in this room because we're not monks. We're, I mean, it would be much easier if I lived in a monastery where I took all the people out of my life. Um, right? It is, I mean, that, it is very much easier. It, and I that's just, why I like to do it. I know. And I need that break. But I think even yesterday, yep. I had a day and I, my Facebook says was I rocked it. I got so much done. But I never once felt hurried. And for me, that was a huge spiritual moment. Like, oh, I get it, Lord. And it's just, and it was, con- everything was so connected. You know, I just think. So that, that you've was... really hit on something important. It's not necessarily the number of tasks mm-hmm. that we have on our list. It's how we're going about those tasks and why we're going about them. And if the results, the consequences, the, the outcomes, if I hold responsibility for all the outcomes in my life, Dallas would say, I ru- you ruthlessly need to give up on outcomes. If it's meant to be, it ain't up to me. That's good. And all of a sudden, now hurry begins to work its way out. But the, the disciplines now, so you're right, the monk life. Very attractive. It's, this very, it's sometimes. 
not the celibacy part of that, but the, there's some other parts that are, that are good. The, well, here's what silence does. People, people think that, you know, oh, well, you know, you go and you, you're, you're silent for a week. Aren't you spiritual? No, 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 no. No, silence is about learning to shut your mouth. Now, how often do I think that I need to get in the last side of my point? Now, for a prof professional talker like me, silence is absolutely critical. Because I need to be able not to say things. And being silent trains me to actually tell my mouth, you don't get to talk. Which comes from often a thought in my mind that says, oh, I need to be heard. And I actually bring that to Jesus and he goes, you know, Gary, I love you and I know what you're thinking and I can, can you trust me that I know the situation better than you? And sometimes there are some things you need to say and sometimes there are some things. Dallas used to say to me early in my career, Gary, you need to learn to suffer the indignity of not telling everybody everything you know all at once. Ladies, we can relate, right? We have, and so we're going to start some of these questions. But okay. Literally, this whole stack is on hurried and versus. So we're going to move on, though. What is the most valuable lesson? This going to be hard. That you've learned from Dallas. Well, uh, in the in the book that Dallas and I wrote together, which which came out in June, which we were working on when he died, um, I wrote that uh, in the introduction. I wrote that Dallas was the first person I met that convinced me, I mean, really convinced me, it went from my mind to my heart, that I could know Jesus just as well as I know any other human being. Because he knew Jesus. And I was convinced that he knew Jesus just as intimately as Peter and James and John. And there were times that I was with Dallas where it was as if... Only moments before he had been with them on the Sea of Galilee in a boat, hearing stories and watching miracles, and I could still smell the fish on his hands. I learned from Dallas that he knew Jesus, and I knew he knew him, and that that was possible for me. Not as a myth, not as a, as a distant figure that was elusive to me, but as a real, living reality that I could engage and that would engage me and that I could have an actual relationship with. I used to say, I believed, Christianity was not a religion, it was a relationship. For most of us, it's a religion because that relationship really isn't a conversational, intimate friendship. It's not that we're equals, but he invites us. He calls us friends. He does that. And Dallas, the, so the greatest lesson I learned from Dallas was that I could smell like fish too. So good. It goes back to, we talked one week about Bible study is kind of where we have the clipboard and you have to have Bible study. But this isn't Bible study. It's more spiritual formation. And I talked about going on a date with Scott and the first thing I was going to do is buy a clipboard because right, I'm going on a date with Scott. <laughs> no, I'm going to buy a new outfit. I want to hang out and just be with him. I don't want to take yeah. notes on him. Yeah. And, and so much of the time, the conversations I have with Jesus, he's actually reading some form of scripture to me. Right. He's explaining what he's already said that I'm not doing. So good. Or could do better, right? What is the best way to encourage others to develop their soul? Um, know that you have one. You got to start there. And you got to know it's precious. Which of Dallas Willard's books... That's it? That's all? Wow, okay, keep going. That's I, good. I, no, that's I, good. That's good. That, that's good. Keep list. going. Keep okay. going. Keep Which going. of Dallas' books impacted like you it. most? Good. Oh, Hearing God, his first book. It, it was the one he was most disappointed that didn't get, you know, more. He couldn't, he couldn't, he was not really disappointed. That's not really the word, but he couldn't figure out why that didn't, you know, wasn't the book that people enjoyed reading more because that for me and others, that really, that was the book. Now, The Divine Conspiracy got more notoriety, but Hearing God is that 
book where y- you actually learn and he walks through all of the difficulties that so many of us have in actually coming to the belief that you can actually have a conversational relationship with Jesus. How do you arrange your day to experience total commitment, joy, and confidence? I don't. Well, we're in good company. I, we're total, trying. Total, total, no. Um, but there are some things that I that I do often. I don't, I'm not religious. I'm not, I should say I am religious about them, but I'm not uh, as good about them. But most days I have a tendency to rise and give my day to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I begin almost, almost every day, especially when I'm writing, but especially on my commute, we have a conversation about what the day's going to be, what I think the day's going to be. So Jesus, I got this going on and I mean, with this person and there's this issue and we talk about my day. And then we talk about my day coming home. And um, so he's this kind of, I really look at Jesus in a lot of ways these days as a captain helping me navigate things. And that's a new thing for us. Um, it's, it's, in the past, it's been more, tell me about this and tell me about this and help me with that and and, but really it's much more about help me see what's going on here and help me navigate this well and help me figure out why I'm feeling or thinking this because I don't know where this is coming from. So we're, we're, he's doing more navigating with me now and explaining the lay of the land of my life more than he ever has. So this, I probably, I probably, this question I that. follows up that perfect. What is the difference between communicating with your soul and simply talking to yourself? Is there a difference? Yes. I don't communicate with my soul. Okay? I don't communicate with my soul. Now, I don't think that that's wrong. I, you know, so in the, in the Psalms, John talks about that the person is saying, oh, my soul, why, why are you downcast? It is a real thing. And you can look at your life and say, self, life, why, why is this, why, why, why are you so downcast? Or why, you know, or oh my soul, rejoice in the Lord. You can actually recognize that all of your being. John does a good job of describing that sometimes when you see a sunset or you're on the beach and you begin to recognize that your mind and your thoughts and your will. Sometimes, I, I, this is really true for me around the holidays when we're having a, uh, a, uh, a meal, a, a celebration of a meal. For me, that kind of feasting and all of my family is around, there's, there's a moment in time where I can feel my soul. I, I know that I'm at a soul level of existence. My relationships, my desires, my body, my mind, m- my whole heart is just overjoyed. And I can sense the soul. And there are also times where I can sense that everything in my life feels like it's collapsing and I begin to feel the weight, the, the, the mourning of the soul. But I find it best to look at the areas of my life, whether it's my thinking that's off. They shouldn't say that to me. I deserve better than that. Right? There, or... Or my body is tired or fatigued or worn out or sick or I've not had enough sleep, right? Or um, there's, this, there's this thing that I have long desired that has been thwarted. That's a heart issue, right? It, I find it better to go to those areas of my life that seem to, to have less air in them or that are struggling than it is to try to deal with the, the whole of the soul. Dallas would say you can't deal with the whole of the soul. You have to deal with the individual aspects. I think you can experience the soul. I think there are times in life if you get quiet enough because your soul and mine is the shyest part of our existence because it is so vital to who you are that if it shows itself and it gets ruined or wrecked, you're in trouble. It's like your hard drive, right? It's the thing that everything runs on. So it, it has a tendency to, to remain protected, even from you, but also from others. It sometimes has to be protected from ideas that you've got in your head that came from somewhere, you know, body image issues or 
you know, who, you, who your parents said you were or weren't. Or It's got to protect itself from those painful ideas and images. And until those ideas go away and the soul can trust that the mind is actually not going to come against it, right? it has a tendency to kind of stay in the background a little bit. And that's why in these times when we feel the soul, there's a sense of holistic freedom and peace, and there's no threat, right? It comes out. So good. We have a couple more questions, but I want to make sure we have time to talk about what it was like to be with Dallas at the end, and also some promises you made to him. And I personally am one that has never wanted to study the end times, and mainly Gary and I started talking about it on the phone, and now I can't get rid of your thoughts to what you brought. And the reason is, the way I've heard people discuss the end times, or heaven even, and the reason I don't want to study it, and this is from a real layman's standpoint, is I think, what is it? It's not helping me live better now. And I really believe mm. the kingdom has come. And I mm -hmm. it, heaven is just like this bonus if it's there. Hallelujah. But yeah. so I, for me, that's where I've been. And I loved um, your sharing on that. And I know you have a book coming out on that. So I'd love yeah. for you to share that with them. And if we have time, we'll do some more of okay. these. But I want to make sure we have time for the tape and some beautiful music and you to talk about this. So Dallas uh, and I began to work on the, the Divine Conspiracy Continued about January. Um, and in March, I think we were all came to the recognition that he had a t kind of a terminal diagnosis and it wasn't going to be, we, we knew that he was probably not going to last very long, but, you know, we thought maybe months at the best a, a year or more, but it ended up being that it, it wasn't months or, or a year. It was just weeks, um, after he went in for his final surgery, they, kind of opened him up and realized that, that that just wasn't a lot of hope. And so I came over, uh, we'd been working on the book for maybe three months, and I came over after he got home from the hospital, and we just began to talk as friends about the, the reality of his mortality, about his impending death. And I fumbled through some words of sadness and mourning and regret and um, and after he was so gracious and he was wanting to stay and praying for healing and, but he was, he was tired and it, it had taken his toll on him too. And so, uh, later that afternoon, we just began to talk about heaven and that turned into about a week long conversation about the, he, as he began to think about heaven. I mean, really put his mental capacity, which is substantial, into the idea of heaven in a way that he had really never done before because this was something, it, it, I, 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 this is just my analysis, but you know, I can remember when Susie and I first were going to go to Paris. I really started to think about Paris. I mean, I, I went and got these kind of tour books and, you know, what art is there and what architecture is there. And I, I kind of sensed that Dallas really, in a, in a way that he hadn't before, really began to think about heaven. And um, so we began to talk about these, uh, his, his thoughts and, and his insights. And um, one day, maybe five or six days later, we were in the library together. He's got a little, he had a little house that was down below it was a, a conjoined lot with another house that was just stuffed to the raft probably a little 1500 square foot house that was just stuffed to the rafters with books and um, you could you, you couldn't find any one book in there but it was stuffed to books and um, but he asked me to pull down a, a del monte's peach box uh, from one of the shelves and it was a it was a box that was had all the class material, um, curriculum and syllabus and notes and, and textbooks that he had used for a class that he had taught many years before at USC on death and immortality. And I watched him for about an hour or two, a long time, for that, for that stage of his sickness, sit and read himself. 
and Dallas ministered to Dallas. His earlier thoughts about when he wasn't facing his own mortality was ministering to him when he was facing his mortality. It was, if there's any good reason to journal, that's it. That's a good one. And so maybe a few days later, he came to me and he said, now, I, I, I want you to think about this. Um, I really want you to write this book about what we've been talking about in heaven. And um, I said, oh, I don't know. And uh, he goes, no, I want you to, I want you to tell me that you're going to do that. And I said, are you really going to do that? Are you going to pull the deathbed promise thing that I'll... Even Dallas did it. And he kind of thought a minute, like, yeah, I probably shouldn't do that. And then he went, yes, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and so um, I began to, you know, we, 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 we didn't get to talk about it much, but we got really the basics down. Um, and so we were kind of working on these two books together uh, as, as he was g- getting Ill, more ill. And so uh, the last four days, Jane called uh, when he was having difficulty getting up and transferring from the bed to the chair, and I had offered that if they need that, because she's four foot nothing, and you know she couldn't. It was dangerous for him to move around and maybe fall and hurt her. And so I said, "Listen, I I'm, I'm here most of the time anyway. Why don't I just spend the night and I can, you know?" And so I made her promise that if that was what they needed, that they would call, and they did. And and so I spent the last four days with Dallas, and then he went to the hospital, and I spent the nights, and Jane would come during the days with Bill and Becky um, and, and John, his son. And um, we, he was never on morphine until the last six hours. Um, and um, he was sick. He was in pain, but his mind remained clear. And he began, we began to continue to talk about our work. He was so devoted. He was so devoted to the gospel. He just knew people needed to know. And he was working on that very thing until the last few hours of his life. And so, um, I just finished that heaven book, uh, maybe, well, I don't know that I'm done. I've rewritten it. You know, I've done the rewrites, and it's now at the publisher, but I think that we're pretty close, and that may be out um, next summer. Um, The primary idea that we're communicating in that book is that there is a mistaken, not, uh, you know, uh, I don't think there's any evil intent in this, but there's a mistaken kind of myth that we often carry with us uh, regarding heaven, and that is that when we die, we kind of, Dallas called it the cosmic car wash. That we go through this car wash, and who, the, what comes out at the other side is the perfected best us when we enter heaven. Now the problem with that is, as Dallas knew, as a philosopher and a phenomenologist, which is one that studies the nature of of things as they are, is he knew that human beings, we are shaped by our choices. That is the nature of what it means to be human. Our character is formed by the choices we make. And our eternal destiny, if you're a good Nazarene or Arminian, is based upon the choice you make to whether or not you're going to follow or not follow Christ. That shapes our eternal destiny, right? 
all the other choices we make regarding our life form our character that have an effect as well. And it, if we remain human, human, human beings through eternity, and there's no argument to suggest that we don't remain human, we become complete humans, sinless humans in heaven. But we remain human beings. We don't become angels. We don't become disembodied spirits. We become who God intended us to become in the beginning in the garden. We were always meant to be human. We will be redeemed human beings. And that means that we will have a character. And that character has to be something that we actually make choices about forming. And therefore, we have a job to do now and into eternity. So Dallas used to always say, it's not about what are you going to do if you died tomorrow and went to eternity. The question is, who are you going to be in eternity? What kind of person are you going to be for all eternity? You are choosing, and I am choosing, how our character is formed now. And so the book is about describing the biblical case for that. Wow. I might be a mess. That's going to be... You're, what's the name of the book? I don't know yet. They'll change the title four times between now and the time it comes out. But Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I, I... We have read from Jesus' death up. So, are you thinking that I will, my character will be one thing and my body will be the best body? For sure, our bodies will be better than these. I have to believe. Or it's Paul not makes heaven. That, Paul makes that argument that yeah. right now we have tents and then we will have these permanent structures. Yes. But the best you in great measure is up to you. I, I got that. I, yes. I'm hoping that it's going to be four pounds lighter. <laughs> <laughs> you know. We don't say anything about that. We don't know what the eternal body is going to be, but that, that you will have, you will be resurrected bodies, that you will be redeemed bodies, that we will have a bodily experience. Jesus dem demonstrates that after the resurrection. All right, we have time for one more question, or I'll use one from the list, but did anyone have a question? All right, in the back, we'll do yours, and then we're going to... Oh. Yeah. So Dallas made this comment uh, in one of his final uh, uh, um, conferences at um, Santa Barbara, uh, but he also said it, in, he's written it in other places, that... that it, it could be that heaven is not so different like we seem to, to imagine it to be. That a lot of the metaphors and illustrations that the Bible use, we've had a tendency to actually kind of create this, this uh, paradise that is so other than what this is that we have this imagination that we're just going to, it's going to be massively different. And he said, no, I think that it may be such that some people have a character and a spirit that has been living from the sources of heaven to such a degree that when they die, they may not know exactly what's happened for some while. Wow. Well, I think we're going to end on that.